Hello citizens of internet. I am Professor Ajit Virkod from Mumbai, India. Today I am going to discuss a small but an important topic, endometrial hyperplasia. It is important because endometrial hyperplasia is a precursor lesion for endometrial carcinoma, especially endometroid type. Endometrial hyperplasia is defined as an abnormal proliferation of the endometrial glands relative to the stroma resulting in an increased gland to stroma ratio when compared with proliferative endometrium. The change can be local, patchy or diffuse and can vary in severity from area to area. For understanding this definition, one needs to know what is normal gland to stroma ratio and for that we need to go back to basics. In the proliferative phase, the gland to stroma ratio is less than 50%. In the secretory phase, however, the gland to stroma ratio increases to more than 50%. The etiology of this condition is fairly straightforward. It is caused by unopposed estrogenic stimulation of the endometrial tissue with a relative deficiency of the counterbalancing effects of progesterone. The end result of this continuous estrogenic stimulation is endometrial hyperplasia. Are any genetic factors responsible for causing endometrial hyperplasia? Yes, they are observed in 20% of endometrial hyperplasias. Patients with endometrial hyperplasia have mutation of the P10 gene. P10 gene encodes a lipid phosphatase enzyme. It is a negative regulator of phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase PI3K and AKT growth regulatory pathway. So whenever there is mutation of the P10 gene, there is uncontrolled overactivity of PI3K and AKT pathway and this abnormally enhances the ability of estrogen receptors to express its target genes resulting in increased and prolonged stimulation by estrogen. This may take years but the end result is endometrial hyperplasia. This diagram shows the role of other genes such as KRAS that causes microsatellite instability and other genes like ARID1A, PIK3CA and FGGR2 in gradual progression of precancerous condition to endometroid cancer. Some of the risk factors associated with endometrial hyperplasia are obesity, PCOS, estrogen replacement therapy, tamoxifen, functional granulosa cell tumors of ovary or rarely ovarian cortical hyperplasia. Early menarche and late menopause are other risk factors. Mitigation or treatment of these risk factors, if possible, will go a long way in preventing endometrial hyperplasia. The revised 2014 WHO classification is recommended. This separates endometrial hyperplasia into two groups based upon the presence of nuclear ATPR. The groups are hyperplasia without atypia also known as typical hyperplasia and hyperplasia with atypia also known as atypical hyperplasia. There is another classification which is more complex, no pun intended and not used. It divides the patients into four groups. Simple hyperplasia without atypia also known as cystic endometrial hyperplasia simple hyperplasia with atypia, complex hyperplasia without atypia and complex hyperplasia with atypia. This is actual pathology slide showing hyperplasia without atypia. It shows following diagnostic features. The glands show variation in size and shape. Few glands may be cystically dilated. When the cystically dilated glands are more, those lesions are labeled cystoglandular hyperplasia. Focal glandular crowding may be noted. Intervening stroma is very much reduced and usually predominantly compact. This is another slide where all these features are labeled. 
This is another actual pathology slide showing hyperplasia with atypia. The glands show architectural complexity with nuclear atypia of the lining cells. Individual cells are rounded and lose the normal perpendicular orientation to the basement membrane. In addition, the nuclei have open vesicular chromatin and conspicuous nucleoli. This is another slide highlighting these features. Now, let's see what is the risk of malignancy. Hyperplasia without atypia rarely progresses to adenocarcinoma. In these women, approximately 1-3% to will develop endometrial carcinoma over 20 years. In women showing hyperplasia with atypia, up to 50% of women are found to have adenocarcinoma following hysterectomy. Patients with endometrial hyperplasia present with abnormal uterine bleeding in the form of menorrhagia and or metorrhagia, unscheduled bleeding also known as breakthrough bleeding and in older women postmenopausal bleeding. Coming to diagnosis, the most important thing to keep in mind is that endometrial hyperplasia is a histologic diagnosis often made after sampling an endometrium. Although histologic evaluation is crucial, pelvic ultrasound imaging has an equally important role in the evaluation of these patients. In a symptomatic patient where endometrial hyperplasia is suspected, transvaginal pelvic ultrasonography must be done to look for presence of endometrial thickening. In patients of reproductive age group, the ultrasound diagnostic criteria is diffuse smooth thickening greater than 10 mm. In postmenopausal women, however, a thickness greater than 5 mm is considered abnormal. The endometrial thickness should be measured at its thickest point with calipers placed from one echogenic border to the opposite echogenic border, perpendicular to the endometrial stripe. If any fluid is present in the cavity, it should be subtracted from the measurement. There is insufficient evidence evaluating computerized tomography CT and MRI or biomarkers as aids in the management of endometrial hyperplasia and their use is not routinely recommended. Another method for diagnosis is endometrial sampling in an office setting using disposable pipel or any other similar device done without anesthesia. Remember, this is a cytological diagnosis that is endometrial brush cytology like a pap smear and not a histopathological diagnosis. It has a good correlation with histopathological diagnosis after global curettage. Surgical sampling becomes necessary if office sampling does not provide a sufficient specimen for examination or if abnormal bleeding persists despite a previously negative report. Surgical sampling of the entire endometrium is the gold standard method for confirming the diagnosis. This can be done via dilatation and curettage or suction curate or hysteroscopically directed endometrial biopsy. Here I must point out that almost everyone including most literature on the topic says that endometrial biopsy is the gold standard. Being a stickler for correct terminology, I don't agree with the term endometrial biopsy because what it implies is that one takes a few strips from the four walls of the uterus and sends it out for histopathological examination. But if they do this, they may miss the diagnosis because endometrial carcinoma can be a patchy lesion as I have said earlier and the areas which are missed may harbor the disease. So the correct terminology is global curettage. Let me add after that, the entire endometrial sample must be sent to the path lab also, the pathologist must study numerous samples before giving a diagnosis. I go so far as to send the sample to two different experienced pathologists after dividing the sample into two parts. The hope is that at least one of them will catch the culprit lurking somewhere in the corner of the uterus. Treatment of hyperplasia without atypia is as follows. The first thing to do is to counsel the patient. Women should be informed that the risk of endometrial hyperplasia without atypia progressing to endometrial cancer is less than 5% over 20 years 
and that majority of cases of endometrial hyperplasia without atpi will regress spontaneously during follow up reversible risk factors such as obesity and the use of hormone replacement therapy or drugs like tamoxifen should be identified and addressed if possible observation alone with 6 monthly follow up endometrial biopsies to ensure disease regression should be considered progesterone treatment is indicated in women who fail to regress following observation alone and in symptomatic women with abnormal uterine bleeding medical management has a high cure rate progesterone therapy that is bedroxy progesterone 10 to 20 mg daily or norethesterone 10 mg to 15 mg daily given continuously and not cyclically for minimum 6 months leads to a high rate of regression cyclical progesterones should not be used because they are less effective in inducing regression of endometrial hyperplasia without atpi compared with continuous oral progesterones or lng intrauterine system the risk for the development of endometrial cancer is diminished approximately 3 fold to 5 fold when treated with progestins injectable progesterones that is depo medroxy progesterone acetate 150 mg injection at two monthly intervals can also be used rcog green top guidelines recommend that lng intrauterine system should be the first line medical treatment because compared with oral progesterones it has a higher disease regression rate with a more favorable bleeding profile and it is associated with fewer adverse effects women with atypical hyperplasia should undergo total hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo oophorectomy because of the risk of underlying malignancy or progression to cancer a laparoscopic approach to total hysterectomy is preferable to an abdominal approach as it is associated with a shorter hospital stay less post operative pain and quicker recovery in conclusion i will say a high level of clinical suspicion followed by transvaginal ultrasound and a low threshold for endometrial sampling will help one reach a definitive diagnosis early diagnosis of endometrial hyperplasia and intervention is of utmost importance in reducing the prevalence of endometrial cancer if you want to know more about this topic or any other topic in obstetrics and gynecology please refer to my books modern gynecology modern obstetrics and practical obstetrics and gynecology and other books for purchase inquiries contact me on this whatsapp number i have also published two question answer books which are particularly useful for exam going students these are clinical cases in obstetrics 1000 plus questions and answers and clinical cases in gynecology 1000 plus questions and answers you can also follow me on other social media platforms like facebook or meta blogspot and instagram the links are given here if you enjoyed this video hit the like button share it with your friends and also subscribe to my channel for more videos like this thank you for watching